New Walk Church, what is going on? We love you, we miss you. We're here at church to record this for you wherever you are at. We just wanna make one thing clear that we are here to worship Jesus. Matthew 11, 28 says, Come to me, all who labor and all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Right here, right now, we are in a time of worship to exalt Jesus' name, to praise him. No matter what your relationship is like with him, this is your time, and we don't want you to miss it. So would you sing this bridge with me? Come on. And nations bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name over all Jesus raised. to worship. We're going to give all we got just to praise, to exalt your name today. We love you and we give you praise. Come on, you sing with me. Don't lose heart. And don't lose heart. Oh my soul, oh my soul. Don't give up. There is hope. comfortable just lift your hands with me Jesus we praise nations bow mountains shake at the sound of just one name over all Jesus reigns
Amen, church. We're gonna continue to worship. It's a crazy time, but our God is still a healing God. If you believe he's a healing God, type that amen in the chat. We're gonna call upon the Lord today and believe that he is a healer. Come on. Come like you want to. Come like you want to. Jesus, have your way. That's right. Amen. God of the breakthrough, nothing can stop you. Let your freedom reign. And Lord, you're falling. You're falling now like heaven's rain enthroned upon your children's praise. You're tearing down our barricades as we say we welcome the healer in this place. We welcome the of heaven here in your presence and oh how good you are yes you are you're falling now like heaven's rain in front tearing down our barricades as we say we welcome the healer in this place we welcome the author of our faith we welcome the God who makes a way his name is Jesus his name is Jesus your heart and come and bring the breakthrough we surrender to you all our hope is in you God yes it is let it come
Jesus faded all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed me white as snow. He washed me white as snow. You know, if we believe that truth this morning, that Jesus paid it all for us, then I want you to stop for whatever you're doing right now. I want you to just take a moment, close your eyes, and let's exalt Him and Him alone, because He deserves the praise. So in your living room, just take a moment, and we're going to make this all about Him. And sing this with me. And I exalt. What's up, New Walk? Guys, I'm so grateful you decided to tune in with us again. I'm Rusty Griffith, I'm the student pastor here, and I just wanna take a minute and welcome you all to our gathering. 
So we have a special group of people we want to say welcome to, and that's our VIPs. Y'all give it up for our VIPs. Yeah, so if this is your first time watching, we call you a VIP and we think you're incredibly important to us. And so we just wanna take a minute and tell you how thankful we are that you tuned in, but we also want you to fill out a connect card and let us know it's your first time watching. If you do, you'll receive some correspondence back from us and we just can't wait to hear from you and to see you and to continue to love on you in this season. If you're one of our regular viewers, someone that watches all the time, we are incredibly grateful for you too and we miss you terribly. These halls are not the same without you, but we also want you to fill out a connect card so we can reach out to you in this time. Guys, we really want to continue to be the church during this season, and hopefully it's coming soon. Hopefully it's wrapping up soon, but we don't know. And so because of that, we want to continue to love on you guys. So be a part of that. Also, I want to tell you, if you are a part of New Walk, if that's something that this is your home church, we want you to continue to give. Did you know that last week we gave out 1,400 meals to the community around us? 1,400. And this week we're doing it all over again. So obviously coming up this week we have tuesday we're taking up food friday we're able to give out food and we're going to continue to do that over and over and over again and the way you can partner with us is a by giving food on tuesday dry goods and um also, if you want to be a part of that, if you can't give dry goods, then continuing to give financially so we can continue to be the church during this season. So we want you to be a part of that. Also, just so you're aware, Pastor Gary's fixing to come and he's fixing to deliver the last message in this sermon series. And we're talking about the fact that why we know that Jesus is real. And so take a minute, hit the share button, comment on a few folks that need to see this video because we know that this is so incredibly important. Also, don't forget that next week is Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day. So if you don't know, men, you need to get on buying a gift. Amazon has prime shipping. Feel free to send something to her. Write a note, write a card, go get some flowers. It may be a little hard because of social distancing. So you need to get on that right now. Guys, we're so thankful that you decided to come this way. We're so thankful you decided to partner with us. And we cannot wait for this message that Pastor Gary has. So you guys tune in because there's going to be some really cool things coming. going on, New Walk? Thank you again for tuning in, joining us, whether you're watching on Facebook or whether you're watching on newwalk.live. Glad you're journeying with us as we get through this together. I'm looking forward to finishing out this week our series, Is It Real? We're asking questions. We're asking critical questions, and I'm looking forward to closing that out with this critical topic this week. Next week, we're going to get into Mother's Day weekend, and I'm going to share a topic for the ladies and their families, and so hopefully you'll gather around and support the, the mamas and listen to the message, because that'll be critical. Next weekend is Mother's Day weekend. Uh, we are continuing to get engaged through online work, and, and our presence online is reaching more and more people. I want to say thank you. Last week, I challenged you to get more and more engaged online, to comment, to share, to fill out the connect cards, uh, get more connected, tell us what's going on in your life, fill out the prayer request. I want to encourage you to do that again. If you haven't decided to engage, get more engaged to the online venue. It makes a difference for all of us when we see the community working together. And of course, those of you that are giving, I want to every week give a shout out. Thank you, thank you, thank you for giving. It is making a difference. I am so grateful for those of you. I know not everybody has a job right now, but those of you that do, you're still giving. So thank you for that. The last week of our series is about the central question. You know, years ago, there was a song by an artist named Megan Trainer. She said it was all about that bass. Well, let me tell you something. When it comes to Christianity, it's not all about the bass, but it's all about the resurrection. Everything centers around the resurrection. That's what I want to talk to you about here today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so critical in what we believe. In fact, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 17. He put it plainly to you and I. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then your faith is, look at that word there. You're looking at it on the screen. Your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. Look, without Jesus Christ, rising from the dead. There is no resurrection. There is no hope for those who are in their sin. We are dead in our sin, and that's a nasty place to be. 
Paul making it very clear right here in the text that it is all about the resurrection. And today, we're going to ask some questions. We're going to deal with some hot topics, some hot thoughts about why people doubt the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're just simply going to ask some questions, and, and, and we're going to go there. <laughs> we're we're going to go there. I, I'd have to tell you that um, part of the foundation of my faith was built on asking questions. I've always liked to ask questions. I, since a young age, I, I like to ask questions just about anything. It would drive my parents crazy. We'd be going somewhere. I'd be asking questions. I was asking questions, and my mama would say this to me. Maybe your mama said it to you as well. you asking so many questions. What are you, writing a book? And I would say, yeah, mom, I'm writing a book. And she'd say, well, why don't you leave this chapter of mysteries? Because she got so sick of hearing the questions. I've always been a question person. Maybe you have been as well. It led me to, uh, to my faith. And, and seeing those questions answered in my life. And we've said from the very beginning of our church, we're always telling you there is no question quota with God. It is okay to ask and ask and ask because God will deliver. And in this series, we've been dealing with very serious questions about creation, about evolution, about the Bible. And we see time and time again, God being true over and over and over. So he doesn't care if we ask questions and he doesn't mind at all if we ask questions about the central piece of our faith, Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Think about it. Like we talked about last week, Jesus said, all of the Old Testament points to me. Of course, we know the New Testament is all about Jesus, his life, death, resurrection, things that he taught. We have that. At the center of it all is Jesus. If he did not rise from the dead, if he was not who he said he was, that makes him a liar. That makes everything that we thought about how the Old Testament pointed Jesus, it makes everything in the New Testament, it makes it void. But if he did rise from the dead, it makes it 100% all true. It's validating is what I mean. And so now what we got to do is makes it true to our faith. We got we to gotta unpack then what are the critical questions to ask? What are the things we need to deal with? And I do understand that in an audience like this, as you're watching this right now, there are many of you who would say, bro, you don't have to convince me. I believe you rose from the dead. It's no problem. I get it. I get it. And you could give me possibly a bunch of reasons why you believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You could probably li maybe list them out. Like, I know it. I get it. And I praise God if you're able to do that. But I also know that right now watching this, there are some people if you were to kind of be pushed in the corner about your faith and why you believe in the resurrection, why you believe in something that seems like maybe to the surface a fairy tale, there are some of you, you, you couldn't give an answer. You're, you're not prepared, you're not equipped to give an answer. So I'm hoping I can help those of you who call yourselves believers give you some equipping here today. If you're not a believer, you're a skeptic, I welcome you in. Watch, join us, join in on the questioning with us, see the answers to these questions. And I want to just do an overarching thing about all of this and say this, whether it's any of the weeks of our series, hear me, the number one way that you and I let others know that the resurrected Jesus is real to us is we live it out in our lives. We live out the things that Jesus taught us. If you are living it out in your life, that is the way people get it. That's the way people see it in your life. They say, I get it. It happened for you. I want what you have. So let's not forget. We can get all the facts, all the figures, all the science, all the history, all the documentation. We can take all the notes we want. But the number one way people are going to know that Jesus is real is through your life. But I do want to give you the tools. I do want to continue to give you the resources. I want to uh, do what it says in Ecclesiastes 7.25. I directed my mind to know, to investigate, and to seek wisdom and an explanation. Don't be a skeptic just because somebody told you to be a skeptic. Don't be a skeptic because your bearded professor told you Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Don't be a skeptic because somebody else told you it was a fairy tale. Unpack and get to the truth. Now, I want to be clear about history and uh, the, the life of Jesus 
and the death of Jesus and the placement of Jesus in the tomb, I want to let you know that it is widely accepted that there was a guy named Jesus who walked this earth. Uh, He did indeed. He was born in Bethlehem. He did grow up in Nazareth. He claimed to be the Son of God. Uh, He was teaching thousands of people. He was arrested. He was tried. He was convicted. He was crucified between two common thieves, and then he was placed in a tomb with a stone in front of it under the guard of a Roman guard. I'm saying what I just shared with you right there. No major historians, believers or non-believers, secular Christian, they don't debate this. In in our history today, in the documentation that we have about Jesus' life, through all different places, no serious-minded historian or scholar, believer or non-believer, argues about the life and death of Jesus Christ. What, of course, is debated is what happened the next 72 hours after that in this moment where we understand as believers that Jesus conquered the grave, that he came forth from death to life, that there is a resurrection power that we embrace as believers that is the part that is debated because the skeptic says, wait a minute, dead men don't rise, the moon is not made of cheese, the rays are never going to win the World Series, so come on, what are you talking about? Well, I can tell you, a dead man did rise, and the proof is it is absolutely heavy. And we need to deal with the claims that are out there, though. And what I wanted to do is just unpack a couple of claims, because if the tomb was empty... The question becomes, how did it become empty? And I want to tell you that, again, most scholars do not debate that the tomb was empty. So then it's like, okay, okay, okay. It comes down to how was it empty? And here's a difficult claim that sometimes is made, and I I put this in your notes. The tomb wasn't really empty, at least the way that all the Christians and all the disciples said it happened. You know, they came up with some sort of scheme, but you know, when the, the women went to the tomb and saw the stone roll away and saw that Jesus wasn't there and the angels said, hey, why are you looking, uh, why are you looking for the living? He, why are you looking for the dead here? You know, he's, he isn't dead. He's risen from the dead. He's living. He's full. He has made whole. Stop looking for this dead man. He has risen. And they said, man, he is not here. The scriptures say in Matthew 28 and 6, he has risen just as he said, come and see the place where they laid him. It has happened, and they're running around talking about that resurrection, but isn't it possible that they worked a broad scheme here? I mean, isn't it possible that there's another explanation to why the tomb was empty? Skeptics would tell you and I that here's what happened maybe. A bunch of ragtag disciples got together came up with a scheme, came up with a plan, and uh, worked it all out and said, you know what we got to (laughs) do? We got to make this thing happen one way or another. He's got to rise from the dead. Let's concoct a scheme. Let's get in with the Roman government, the Roman guards, really pretty much everywhere, and let's get with people and make this thing happen. Let's run around and tell everybody that Jesus rose, will hide his body somewhere else. But this runs into significant problems. Uh, First of all, what we do know is that there were people quickly proclaiming Jesus rose, Jesus rose, Jesus rose from the dead. In a little bit, I'm going to tell you what the disciples were up to before the resurrected Jesus. It's very compelling to this sort of argument, but I do want to say that this thought about them moving of the body around and, and, and how the, this was all handled is, is really debunked in a few different things. And I put these in your notes. The, one of the things you have to deal with if you're going to believe that they concocted this scheme to move the body around is the Jerusalem factor. The Jerusalem factor is simply this. Everybody knew where Jesus was being buried Everybody knew that these guys were proclaiming Jesus to be spectacular. All eyes were on them. All eyes were on them. I mean, they were being hunted as well, these disciples. 
Everybody knew, this wasn't like some mystery place that nobody knew about. It was under guard. The Roman government knew about this tomb. Uh, the, 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 the chief priests and Pharisees, the religious leaders, they knew they were pushing against Jesus. They wanted him dead. Everybody knew where this location was, and it wasn't like you could just walk in there. You, you're not bribing a Roman guard who will be put to death if that body is gone. It was not something that could happen in such a sort of easy fashion. Now, there's something else that I want to share with you about the empty tomb that's so critical. The way history records it is that some, some women went there first to testify, and that brings us to the next claim or the next criterion. It's called the criterion of embarrassment. How do you accept the account that it was a resurrected Jesus, that the tomb was empty and that the disciples didn't have anything to do with it, it's by the fact that the recordings that the disciples and the people who wrote about Jesus' resurrection, they chose to utilize the first eyewitnesses as women to the empty tomb. During that time, during that culture, this is a big deal because during that culture, it was not accepted that you would get testimony from women or eyewitness accounts from women. They would be heavily discounted. They, they wanted the testimony from the men and the men only. And, and here's what we see is history recording that the first people to see the tomb was empty as the angels are talking to them. Uh, these were women and history documents that. And here's what we know. This is magnificent because if I was trying to concoct a scheme and document a false scheme about the resurrected Jesus, I would never utilize the testimony of women during that time. That just wouldn't be... But the, they weren't worried about that. They were interested in recording it exactly how it was noted. And was, this was one of the reasons when Luke was... The physician Luke was compiling all the facts about Jesus' life. He said this, is, he, this would have been... He would have known how incredible it was that they accepted the testimony of these women as a fact, as a part of history, exactly how it all went down. There's another thing about this concoction where the, where the disciples maybe would have gone after the body and got a scheme, and it's this, and I touched on a little bit earlier, it's called enemy attestation. They were frantically, can you imagine the disciples are running around going, he rose from the dead, he rose from the dead, he rose from the dead. How quickly do you think it would take the Roman government to go all out and find that body if they could? They haven't found, they haven't found it to, still today. Don't you think during that time the body would have been produced? Uh, these guys would have cracked under pressure, under the threat of being killed. Okay, 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 you know what, here's his body. They never found his body. And the enemy attestation is one that, as we go back in history, we see everybody is looking for the, the, the what, where did the body go? What, how did this, how did this happen? The claim that the disciples got together and did something else with his body, it's just not helpful. It's, just, it's slightly ignorant of the facts of history. Now, here's another claim. Difficult claim number two is this, Jesus wasn't really dead. You know what? He got uh, beaten really bad, hung on the cross, but I'll tell you what they did. You know, had that spear jammed in him, you know, then he was wrapped up, but somehow, somehow, he still lived and he didn't actually fully die. And this is known as the swoon theory, that he was close to death, but somehow he was able, he was able to make it. Uh, this is really wild because uh, you begin to think about what happened during a crucifixion, how good the Roman government was at it, that you need to understand that they were not in the business of failing to kill people in a crucifixion. They were good at it. They did it all the time. They were excellent at making sure people were dead after they went through a crucifixion. There's a medical expert who studied crucifixion time and time again. His name is C. Truman Davis, and he went through the process of, of getting us to understand studying what, the way it was done over and over again. Remember, I said they were good at it. So, uh, and I want to just remind you, this stuff is really 
graphic. Uh, History records a lot of this. The Bible records how it went down as well, very similar to how we see history recorded. Uh, and, And what would take place is when Jesus was found to be guilty, to be put to death, they would, first thing it would have done is, is uh, they would have flogged him, they would have tied him to this whipping post, and then they would have gotten something known as the cat of nine tails. It would be like something tied to a, almost like a wooden bat. It had this leather attached to it. It would stretch out. At the end, it had this ball that had attached to it, these sewn into it, these bone hooks, these bones that were sharpened hooks. And what they would do, and this is graphic, and, and but it's just, I got to just share it with you. Like they would 39 times, here's what they did to Jesus. They slapped him with that ball, the, the, the bone, sharp bones, they dug into his skin, and then they would rip it out. And they did 39 times from, the, from his shoulders down to his legs, rip it out, the cat of nine tails. And I have to tell you that many times uh, there would be just really a bleeding a bleeding to death. The, the criminal, the, the, the persecuted criminal in that moment would, would just not make it all the way to the cross. We know Jesus did. We know that he survived that piece, but then he went to the cross, and then they laid him out there on the cross. But I, I wanted to just give you that moment in history in John 19 and verse 1. It says, then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped Whipped, they, they ripping in there uh, the lead ball with the with the hooks out of it. Boom! It would go into him, and this is what third century historians uh, would. A third century historian Eusebius wrote just about that part alone. The sufferer's veins were laid bare. The very muscles and tendons and bowels of the victim were laid open to exposure. Yeah, that's pretty nasty. But then. I mentioned they laid him on the cross. The cross was laid on the ground, put him on there, stretched his arm out, put his legs down, put the, put the nails in him in a precise position so that when he was raised up and the cross was dropped into the ground, his body would drop. It would do this incredible tearing. It would hit these nerves that were just devastating. Again, they knew exactly what they were doing in this process, and he would just hang there until he died until the person on the cross died. But then something happens just to make sure, just to top it off. Scripture records that they jam a spear into his side. The scriptures say something like water began to flow out of Jesus. Scientists say a sign that the death was ultimately completed in that moment. I said it before, I'll say it again, they knew how to crucify somebody. John thir- John 19 and verse 34, one of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water flowed out, this sign of death. And so people who say that Jesus didn't actually maybe die are saying he survived all that, then was wrapped placed in the tomb, went about 40 hours without food or water, somehow revived in the, th- the air of the tomb, the lack of air in the tomb, whatever that looks like, then, you know, took it all off, got up, pushed this incredible boulder out of the way, and then just started walking around and for miles visiting with people. Really? I, this seems like a very unhealthy story. In fact, an atheist scholar named Gerd Lunderman said this, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. So we're still coming back to, okay, the tomb, the tomb was empty. Uh, How do we know he was really resurrected? And I just want to give you some details here at the truth about the resurrection. How can we compile evidences to say, Yeah, we know that this did indeed happen. And I want to go back to something I talked about last week, which is eyewitness accounts. Eyewitness accounts are so valuable. It's how we get history from that time. People wrote what they saw down. It was done with great care. There were no photographs. There's no newspaper articles. There's no video cameras. There's no iPhone movies that we can look at. It's it's not there. But eyewitness accounts were huge during that time. People writing things down, uh, people in agreement that this is what they saw, this is how it all happened. And when it comes to Jesus and his resurrection, because that's what we're focusing on, uh, Jesus made lots 
of appearances, people saw him and made note of what they saw. You know, back in uh, some of the day of the horror movies that, um, that were made by Alfred, H- Alfred Hitchcock, if you watch those horror movies, he would um, make appearances, little cameo appearances in the, in the movies sometimes. Stephen King does that with some of his um, uh, horror movies. He will make these little appearances at different times in, in the movies, cameo appearances. I'm here to tell you, Jesus didn't make cameo appearances he was there. He was with people. They saw it. He wrote it. They wrote it down. People wrote it down. He appeared to the twelve many times. Uh, he appeared to many. Uh, he, he appeared. Uh, uh, tw- he appeared. Sorry. He appeared twelve times to many. This is what I wrote down in my notes. He appeared to large groups. He appeared to small groups. I wrote this down. He appeared indoors. He appeared outdoors. He appeared to skeptics, and he appeared to. Believers as well, the risen Jesus locked eyes with people time and time again, and they made note. First Corinthians 15 and verse 3, Paul talks about all of the eyewitness accounts. He says this, I passed on to you what was most important and what also had been passed on to me, that Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried and raised from the dead, and on the third day, just as the Scripture said, uh, this all, it all happened, and he was seen by Peter, and then by the 12, and after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still, look at this, at the time this was written, he is, they are still alive. Like, go talk to them if you want to talk to them. Though some, look at the honesty of the text, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, Paul says, you know, I got the later birth beyond all of you. He made an appearance to me. I got a spiritual rebirth because I saw him as well. Uh, Time and time again, people saw Jesus and it it was documented. You may be saying, well, Gary, I heard that sometimes they think maybe that Jesus' uh, his appearance was a part of a hallucination, that people wanted to see Jesus so bad that they hallucinated. And I would submit to you in all the different places and at all the different times, if that was hallucination, folks, that was a bigger miracle than any of them to, for this thing to happen this way. Like, th- this would have been a pretty incredible hallucination. It would have been one that would outdo Woodstock beyond like, what you could ever imagine. We're talking about Mass hallucination is what people want you to believe, and it just doesn't add up because you can go back to what the disciples were doing at the time of Jesus' death, and you will see that they were not sitting around waiting for this to happen. I'll share that uh, with you again in just a little bit, but if you were to take over 500 eyewitness accounts and treat it as though it's like a, a, a courtroom situation, if I was a lawyer, eyewitness account is everything. It's, it's the deal breaker to making a case. There's so much eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of Jesus that we would have to start in the courtroom with all this testimony on Monday, go to Tuesday, all the way through, just keep going. Wednesday, Thursday, keep bringing witnesses. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, one after another, after another, over and over again. It's a lot of eyewitness testimony. And, and at some point, the opposing lawyer would say, okay, we can all just agree they're going to testify to the same thing. Let's just lump it in that 500 and something people saw that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Uh, but if we were to not do that, it would be a lot of testimony. And that amount of testimony demands a verdict. It demands us to say, whoa, whoa. That's a lot of evidence through what eyewitnesses were indeed seeing. I, I want to give you another element that I see as very powerful to understanding that Jesus was who he said he was and did indeed rise from the dead. It's called prophecy accuracy. You compare the prophecy that came hundreds of years before Jesus to what actually happened in Jesus' life, and you see incredible matching taking place. A lot of people in Las Vegas like to predict the future, and they bet money on, you know, what they think about the future. If you are doing well in Las Vegas uh, with your money, 
and making bets. I don't encourage you to do this, but if you were making bets and you get it right about 55% of the time or so, you're going to be winning some money. Uh, 55, you don't have to get it right all the time, just maybe 55% of the time. Well, when you consider the prophecies, you're talking about incredible 100% accuracy. So consider this. If I told you 500 years from now, let's say, I know which team is going to win the Super Bowl, what the score is going to be, I'm going to nail it, I know who the MVP of the game is going to be, and I can tell you exactly how the game-winning touchdown is going to go, and I could give it with accuracy, you would say, that's crazy, that's not even possible yet. <laughs> that's exactly what happened with Jesus' life. Hundreds, this is not disputed. It's not disputed. Scholars understand that hundreds of years before Jesus came, prophecies came forth about his life, and his life lined up with them over and over again. Uh, prophecies about his life included, and I'm just going to read some of them to you. There's 400. I'm going to give you just some of the, the big ones here. Uh, ready? Uh, that the Messiah, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Of course, he was. Uh, born of a virgin, that he would come from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would come from the tribe of Judah, that he would be heir to King David's throne. He would be called Emmanuel, he would spend a season in Egypt. He would be rejected by his own people. He would be a prophet. He would speak in parables. He would be sent to heal the sick and the brokenhearted. That he would be betrayed and the money would be used to buy a potter's field. He would be falsely accused. He would be silent before his accusers. He would be spat upon and struck. He would be hated without a cause, crucified with criminals, be given vinegar to drink. Uh, his hands and feet would be pierced. People would gamble for his garments, that he would pray for his enemies, that there would be a piercing of his side. He would be buried with the rich, and he would be resurrected from the dead. That's just some of them. And all this happened. This wasn't a situation where a bunch of people were gathered around writing the Old Testament as Jesus' life was living so that they could make something happen. No one believes that that happened. Everybody understands that these prophecies came hundreds of years before Jesus. What are the odds of them all coming true? Mathematics and astronomy professor Peter W. Stoner made this statement, the chances of just eight of just eight, I gave you more than eight, if just eight prophecies, come, them coming into alignment all of these years later, uh, are something like this, one in 10 to the 17th power, that's one with 17 zeros after it. Let's give it to you more visually. It would be like covering the state of Florida in silver dollars, two feet deep, marking one silver dollar in all of that pile of silver dollars and dropping you somewhere in the middle of the state and you reaching into that pile two feet deep of silver dollars and you picking out exactly the right one. And I, I gave you a bunch of them. That's only with just eight. If you were to add eight more, the odds now for 16 prophecies coming true would be one to, the, to 10 to the 28th by 10 to the 17th, or 1 to the 45th power, that's 1 with 45 zeros, or 10 to the 45th power, that's 10 with 45 zeros. Uh, Luke 24 and verse 25 uh, talks about this moment where Jesus made this appearance to these guys and started talking to them, like, don't you understand I'm real? Because look at what the prophets said, and look at how my life lined up with it. It says this, how foolish you are. He's talking to these guys. He says, how slow you are to believe everything the prophets said. Was it not necessary for the Messiah? Didn't I have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Jesus explained to him what was said about himself in all the scriptures, talking about the Old Testament, talking about the prophets, beginning with the book of Moses and with all the writings of the prophets. And then it goes on. It says, they said to each other, man, when they had heard all this and realized he was the Messiah, it's like, wasn't it like there was a burning inside of us, like there was something inside of us that was happening, uh, this fire burning in us when he was explaining all the prophecies. That's what I'm doing with you right now. I, 
I hope in my prayers before I spoke this message to you is that a fire would be burning in you just by hearing all the proof and the evidences, maybe just alone with the prophecies about how Jesus' life became a reality and lined up with those scriptures. Here's another way that I know that Jesus' death, burial, and ultimately his resurrection was exactly what we believe it to be. It is by the disciples' death, their deaths. It's centered around so much of the disciples. I mentioned earlier, because there's this thought that they worked on this scheme and then you know, they're just waiting for Jesus to, to die so that they could then work out their scheme. History records that's not what was happening at all. They were in this loser mentality when Jesus was put in the tomb. They were hiding, they were scared, they were running, uh, they were being hunted, they were going in all these different places. They had given up. Uh, Peter was frustrated. He was a fisherman. He went back to work for Bass Pro Shops. And then, you know, you look at uh, Matthew, the tax collector. He thought this thing was going to work out. It wasn't working out the way that he thought. He went back to work for the IRS. And so now there's this like, oh my gosh, it didn't happen the way that we thought. The disciples were in a low place. And then after the resurrection, everything changed. They're preaching boldly. They're preaching loudly. They don't care if they go to prison. They don't care if they get beaten. They don't care what happens to them. What, may I ask, causes such a radical change? Under the threat of being put into prison, it says this, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. What did they see and hear? We all know. That's what exactly what causes them to be transformed. But there's also a power in examining how they died. And you know they died a brutal death. If you go back in history, you see the early followers, disciples, apostles, they died brutally. Can I just share with you how they took this resurrection all the way to their death, the resurrection, resurrected Jesus how they took it all the way to their death. Here's what it says about history. We know that Matthew suffered martyrdom in Ethiopia. He was killed by a sword. Mark died in Alexandria, Egypt, after being dragged by horses through the streets until he was dead. Luke was hanged in Greece as a result of his tremendous preaching to the lost. Peter was crucified upside down on an X-shaped cross, according to church tradition, because he told the tormentors uh, that he felt unworthy to die in the same way that Jesus Christ had died. James the Just, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, was thrown over a hundred feet down from the southeast pinnacle of the temple when he refused to deny his faith in Christ. When they discovered that he survived the fall, his enemies beat James to death with a club. Another was ultimately um, beheaded in Jerusalem. Uh, Bartholomew was martyred for his preaching in Armenia when he was flayed to death by a whip. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Patras, Greece. Uh, the apostle Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India during one of his missionary trips. Jude, brother of Jesus, was killed with arrows when he refused to deny his faith in Jesus Christ. Matthias, the apostle chosen to replace the traitor Judas Iscariot was stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death in Salonica. Uh, the apostle Paul was tortured and beheaded by the emperor Nero in Rome, and John uh, was facing martyrdom as well, although eventually he was at one time released. And I wrote this in my notes, and hear me. People die for untrue things all the time but they rarely die for a lie that they know is a lie. I mean, if you knew that the resurrected Jesus was a lie, wouldn't you at some point go, okay, you're, you're threatening to put me to death. It was all a bunch of garbage. And yet, they went all the way to death. They were willing to do it. What happens? How does something like that occur? We know that it occurs because they saw the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is truth? 
Let me give you the last thing. It's very similar to last week, but how do I know Jesus rose from the dead? It's the changed lives. It's the changed lives that started back then, grown and grown. They've built the movement of the church. By the way, that's a whole another reason why we could know the resurrection is real. It started the church, and the church has not been shaken. It has not been destroyed. It continues to grow and grow and grow. But I have watched personally the growth of our church here at New Walk Church through the life transformation of people who have had encounters with Jesus Christ. It is this radical transformation over and over again. Like I said last week, I have seen marriages restored. I've seen addictions broken, the chains of addiction. I've seen people forgive people who never thought in their life they would ever forgive somebody. I've seen repaired relationships that were broken 10 years, 20 years, for 30 years, finally restored. I've seen people learn how to love in a way that they never loved. I've seen people learn how to serve in a way that they've never served before. I've seen people come alive in the reading of God's Word because their life was transformed by Jesus Christ. And what they did in that, what happened in that encounter produced something that we call life transformation or a conversion. And just in the last couple of years at Newwalk, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of conversions. I've seen thousands of conversions in our 14 years of history at New Walk Church. I've watched it over and over again. What in the world causes something like that to happen? It is an encounter with the resurrected Jesus in some way or another. Skeptics today, you've got to deal with these questions. You've got to maybe for some of you dig a little bit more because millions and millions of people around the world in all different cultures, in all different corners of the earth are having still to this day these radical transformative encounters with Jesus Christ. People that are looking for meaning, people that are looking for purpose, people that are looking for hope, seeking Jesus and finding Him. It is one of the ways that my life has become different. It is, it is the way that my life has become different. It is the only way my life has become different. It is through the transformation and the encounter I had one day in the back of a church with Jesus Christ as I sensed him to be real and my life was transformed and since then we started New Walk Church and we wanted in every corner of our church for the gospel to be preached. We, we wanted our kids to know about it. We wanted our students to know about it. We wanted single people to know about it, married people to know about it, young people, older people to know about it and we've preached and we've preached something like this. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. And time and time again, transformation has happened. Just another truth about what we believe in Jesus Christ. And so now what I want to do is invite you in, maybe as a skeptic, to say, you know what, I've heard enough. The case, I'm ready, I've got a verdict. I'm ready to go. I wanna invite you into that opportunity. And maybe you're in your room, maybe you're, you're walking around listening on a device, maybe you're in your living room and you've not said yes to Jesus Christ. The truth is powerful. Would you bow your head? And would you say, just in your heart, say, God, I am ready. God, I am ready. I, I'm, I'm ready to make this decision. Father, we come to you. God, this reminds me of a, a conversation I had with a skeptic not long ago who said, well, I mean, all religions are the same. No, 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 not even close. And oh, by the way, there is only one who puts their trust in an empty tomb, one that has a resurrected Savior. They are not all the same. This is the way, this is the truth, this is the life because Jesus is right and Jesus is true. You're praying from where you're at. You're saying, Gary, the evidence is real. I'm ready just in your heart. Would you bend a knee to him and say, God, today I surrender what Jesus Christ did on the cross. 
his death, burial, and resurrection. It is, as the scriptures say, for all who believe they receive the forgiveness of their sin. I receive that today. I am ready today, God, to journey with you. To s- Maybe you're sensing right now that forgiveness of your sin just right now. It's a part of the first step of life transformation. The shackles are coming off of you right now. Today, God, I say yes to your son, Jesus Christ. I receive him today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you made that decision, let us know on Facebook. Click the link that you made that decision that they're going to put there in the feed. If you did it on our website, newwalk.live, there's a place right there to click and say, I made that decision. Let us know you made that decision. Thank you so much for watching. Wow, what a powerful message from Pastor Gary. Guys, if you gave your life to Christ, we want to know about it. First off, we celebrate you. What an amazing decision you just made. You went from death to life today, and no one can ever take that away from you. And for us, that is incredible. For you, that's even greater. And so we just want to celebrate with you. So do us a favor. If you're on our newwalk.live platform, click the hand button or the the banner, click it, and let us know that you gave your life to Christ. And if you're on Facebook, let us know by raising your hand, or there's a link to click to fill out every information you can. The reason we want that is so that we want want to celebrate with you. We want to walk with you. We want to talk with you and be able to partner with you during this season. Our hosts are still in the chat. So maybe you have some questions about what you just did or what the next steps are. Or maybe you want to sign up for baptism coming up in the near future. That would be a great thing to do today. So please feel free to respond to our host right now. Also, guys, we want to see your notes. So the notes you just took about why Jesus is real, those notes that could change everything, those notes that might lead a non-believer to Christ, we want to see them. So feel free to shout them out, tag us in your notes. There will be some things coming out that you can tag and and post to, but we want to see them. Maybe you didn't take notes. Watch the next service, or if this is the last one, go back and watch another one. Take notes again and share them with us. Guys, we want to see that. And what a testimony to A, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and when we put them down on paper and people get to see your involvement, but also what a testimony to what a great passion pastor we have and what a great message he preached. So feel free to be a part of that. We would love for you to do that. Also guys, last thing, we want to remind you that we are trying our very best to be the church during this crazy season and we want you to continue to be the church with us by partnering and giving. So there are tabs below, there are ways to do that. There's even a text to give option. So we're making it really easy and we want you to continue to follow out what you have promised God through your tithes and offerings even during this season because guys we're coming back soon and we're going to rock it. And so we want to be prepared for everything that's going to happen coming soon. Guys, I can't wait to see you next week. Until then, have a great day.